welcome to Mount Zion Baptist Church. Let's all stand and take our songbook, if you would, please. Turn to page number 243. I am resolved. Page 243. said? Amen. Oh, one more time they said? Amen. Well, praise the Lord. That's pretty good. That's halfway Baptist right there. You're tired, aren't you? The good weather's wearing you out. Is that what's happening? Who went fishing this week? You several of you did. Oh, man. Who went hiking? No hands. Praise the Lord. Hey, Amen. Good to see you all. Thank you for being in church this morning and uh, had a wonderful week. We took our young people up to Kentucky, take them up there nearly every year for a little youth rally conference, and uh, we took the biggest crowd we've ever took. We got to sit down front. We act like crazy Georgians. We won contests. Hey, we won the basketball contest out of 64 teams. We won. I cannot believe it. We always get beat first round. This year we toughened up. The Bible quiz, there's probably 25 to 30 teams that enter this thing. And the best I figure, we got third place. We got in that final round, and uh, a team from North Carolina cheated. <laughs> Is that how it was, Luke? They had some home cooking refs out there, didn't they? And uh, anyway, we enjoy it. We had a great time. Two of our young girls, Gabby Sandoval and uh, Alexis. Is Alexis here? This morning, Alexis, probably in the Spanish church, them young girls got their salvation settled late after service one night. Miss Kelly spent some time going through the scriptures, and those girls, no more doubts, no more doubts. They know they're saved, and uh, just what, like, thank you for praying for us. Thank you for praying for us. We, uh, we made it home safe. Appreciate the ladies and uh, the men that went with us as chaperones. Just had a good time, just a good time. Well, let's go to prayer. I want you to remember John Barr this morning. John Barr Sr. now, he has pneumonia. And he's got seasonal flu. He does not have COVID, but do pray for him. Brother John's been out of work for about 10 days, and uh, that's not good for their family. And uh, But let's pray for them, if you would, please. And, of course, there's a host of things, host of prayer requests that's in our prayer pages. And uh, what a blessing. Miss Bronnie, I just now, thank you. Good to see you this morning, sister. And uh, so good to see you. And uh, good to see Brother Tom Manuel. Good to see you back in church. And uh Brother Tom Williams did his blessed wife's funeral um, Tuesday. That was Tuesday. And just a fine job. Just a fine job. Oh, so much to say. Let's ask God to get in on this. Father, we love you. We thank you for the goodness of being your child. Lord, if that's all it was, it'd be good enough. But, Lord, you daily loaded us with so many benefits. Father, it'd be hard for us to complain. And I pray you'll help us this morning. Oh, please help us. Help us as we go from this place to another place, another place throughout our day. But, Lord, help us as we serve you today. Sing and praise. Lift up your voice, our voices to you. Bless the preaching. I pray that it be a great day. I pray so our boys and girls will pay attention. Sit up straight. Listen. 
Mm -hmm. Lord, this is further admonition and help. I pray you'll help us now, Father. But, Lord, please help Brother John, of course, many, Miss Brenda's brother, her mom, um, just so many as I begin to think of folks. But, but God, I pray you'll bless Brother John Barr. Please strengthen his body, Father. Please strengthen his body. And, uh, Lord, help him get back on his feet to be back at work for his family. And uh, just go with us now. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated, church.
Amen. Amen. Let's stand and take our songbooks again. Page number 267. I know whom I have believed. Page number 267. Sing out on the song if you would, please. seated all right and while you're being seated take your songbook right back out please if you would turn to page number 500 page number 500 pass me not old gentle savior pass me not old gentle savior here in the Atlanta City Baptist fellows sing that song. Brother, you want to talk about soul field, let me tell you. Sing, let's try to sing it that way, huh? Let, let, let the words get to you. This is a good song. It really is. All right, here we go. Verse 2. Let me at thy throne of mercy Before I have y'all come, let me testify. He's, he was talking about, uh, if you ever been down the rescue mission, um, I think they sing that song every service. And 
um, they, uh, it's called soul singing and the old Negro spirituals and uh, them men sing that better than I've ever heard but it's a, it's a cry and uh, I, I was going to testify before Brother um, Goucher said that but there's a gentleman that comes in here and uh, I'm, Paul Shelton's his name he's not here today but Paul's been coming about twice a month Paul walks in here every Sunday he'll tell you I'm not saved he comes from an old Church of God background. How many have Church of God roots? Anybody have any Church of God roots in here? They're thick all over around here. And Paul's 82 or 83. And Paul will tell you, I ain't good enough to get saved. Every time he walks out the doors, if you won't follow him one day, do it and hear it. He'll say, Reverend, maybe next time. Maybe next time, Reverend. Maybe next time, Reverend. And uh, I took his hymnal to his house one time. And I read this to him. I didn't sing it to him. And I said, Paul, he ain't ever promised. We ain't ever promised to get a second chance. Please listen to me. If you're sitting here today and you don't know you're saved or you're burdened with your salvation, this is not a cry of hoping to get saved. The Savior's ready right now. And I mean, by the way, he's been ready your whole life. Amen. Submit to him. Put your faith in Christ. Oh, my goodness, what a blessing. What a blessing. Thank you, Brother Gouch. I, I rarely ever know what's being sung. I just tell these song leaders, just keep it inside that book. And then get the old gospel ship, which ain't in this book ever so often. Amen. And uh, very, very good. Ushers, y'all come. I'll get to preach in a second. Y'all come. The bulletins are there in the back. Please make sure you get a bulletin. I'll switch. And uh, get you a bulletin if you don't have it. A lot of things are coming up. I won't go into detail all, none of them at all. Uh, I want to wish happy, uh, no, anniversary, excuse me, anniversary to Stacy and Jordan Quinn, three years on Thursday. Ain't that a blessing? Praise the Lord. And to Wayne and Helen Carter. And I hope all you old timers will remember Brother Wayne and Miss Helen. They'll be married 25 years on Saturday. Gary and Jennifer Minardi have an anniversary on next Sunday, 18 years, so what a blessing there. Monday night, the 29th, I don't want you to miss it. You start down. I've announced that thing for six weeks. I want you to be here part of a family night. You'll enjoy it. Wedding showers coming up for Brian and Rachel Prater, Brian Cowart and Rachel Prater. And so y'all be there. They're registered, and uh, please be here for fellowship that night. You'll enjoy that. Be good to Rachel. Maybe we'll get them back when they get married. We want them to join this church, not that church. Anyway, that's my personal feelings. I thought I'd let you hear it tonight. There's a marriage uh, seminar conference next weekend at Solid Rock Baptist Church in Newnan. And uh, if you've not registered for that, please do that. Now, I'm going Friday night. I'm not going to be able to go Saturday. But if you want to go in Friday night, there's no registration for that. Uh, but they need to know prepared how to set up seats. So if you want to do that, please let us know. The 17th, it's just a couple of weeks away. On Wednesday, we're going to turn our Bible study into a preaching night. Brother William Davis from um, Clay's Mill Baptist Church in Kentucky is going to be here. His profession is accounting, and uh, he's just a guru in uh, finances. Uh, so we've gone to QuickBooks with our financial system. He comes in and does us an internal audit every year, and so he'll be with us all day on Wednesday. And so we always ask him to come preach. He's a good preacher. He's a good preacher. Please be here that night. We will have choir practices for the youth and the teenagers. Out of going is normal. We will pray when the service is over. Uh, but be here. we'll have a great service that night, and, uh, and I know you'll enjoy it. On the front there, it's a cheat sheet. Can any adult stand down and give me all 66 books of the Bible? I'll give you a sucker after it's over. Anybody <laughs> want to do that? So work on this now. We, we're, getting, we're getting involved with this at a church next month. It'll be the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 uh, disciples of Christ. It, it'll be different things like that, but we're trying to learn. Uh, there was a study sheet that was passed out in Sunday school today. That is not to be turned in. You know, it's, it's just for your accountability to help you with those things. A memory verse that goes alongside of it, and so you'll help that. How many got that little packet of religion and cults? Anybody get that this morning? Uh, mainly hand out in adult Sunday school classes. We did run out. I'll have ad additional copies tonight. V uh, probably the quarter of it is information about the cult. Islam, Buddhism, different things like that. Growing religion right now in the South is called Scientology. You need to know something about it. But the next half of it deals with how to be a witness. 
How do you witness to these groups of people? And you don't have to in, in, in involve yourself totally with their doctrine as long as you know the right doctrine. But there's some talking points that will help you with folks. And uh, so that's a handout that's gone out this morning. Uh, we'll make sure we have some tonight before we meet back. So please let's remember that, if you will. Let's go to our offering now and uh, ask God to bless us. Brother Devin, would you pray for us? First John chapter number two this morning, and First uh, John chapter two. Have y'all met Bella yet? Bella, look at her. Raise her hand. Look at her. Raise her hand. <laughs> this is a. Is it? Have I got it right? Is it the Maynards? Maynard. Maynard. Good to have y'all. They. This is their second Sunday here. They're here because of the invitation of Stacy Quinn, and uh, this little girl. They are. They are getting in the process of adopting this little girl. And, uh, yeah, they've had her for, since she's a baby, right? 
two years, and uh, she just, uh, she didn't like me last week in the parking lot, now she's smiling at me, that's real good, and uh, y'all have been a joy, thank y'all for being here this morning, I've been in Kentucky, I didn't get a chance to come visit you and different things like that, and I thank y'all for coming, but we, I want y'all to pray with them, they asked me last week if, of course I found out about it and asked if we could help anyway, and of course they just said pray for us, and I hope you'll add her, I wouldn't hear Wednesday night, but Let's pray for this family that they can adopt this child and uh, uh, you never would know unless they tell you and uh, she calls them mom and dad and she loves them and uh, let's help them with this burden. Would you do that church? Would you do that? And uh, oh, now Kellyanna's smiling at me. Well, revivals took place today, amen. Well, 1 John chapter 2, I want you to look at verse 6 this morning, just verse number 6. We kind of got into that a little bit. Uh, two Sundays ago, Brother Steve Rhymes. I hope you enjoyed that Bible message his last week. He did a great job with the scriptures. And um, so we've been all for one week. We have, we have gone through 1 John uh, a little bit over the last couple of weeks. And uh, the big deal with 1 John is that you've got to understand you're in a fellowship. You're in a fellowship. When you get out of the fellowship of God, the devil's going to attack you on your assurance. Now, I bring up the old church of God. I'm not, please don't think I'm trying to be mean or, or against them. But one of the great doctrines that they lack in their faith is that rarely many or rarely any of them believe in the security of the believer. Now, they believe in getting saved, as, you know, similar to the way we believe, but they don't think you can keep it. So we believe that once you get saved, you're always saved. Can you say that with me? Once saved... That ain't a Baptist thing. It's a Bible thing. So 1 John is not dealing with getting saved. 1 John is helping you restore the joy of your salvation. That's what 1 John's all about. So we find out in chapter 1 that we have an advocate. So in this message, if you tried to follow, especially with notes, we're dealing with the passion of fellowship in chapter number 2. There's a passion that we have, and we made it clear two weeks ago. And, and write this down if you don't have this, because this is all going to work together. Uh, we found out in this passion of fellowship, you have to be loyal to the head of the fellowship. Now listen, every organization in the world's got a head. Uh, today, there's got to be a dad. Dad's got to lead the home. He's got to be in charge. Your boss at the work, you know, it's, that's your boss. Whether you like it or not, listen to him. Do what he says. You know, it's his company. He's the one that pays the liability and insurance. You know, he's the one that's going to jail or something. Listen to your boss. Uh, down at the church house, there is a pastor. There are deacons. Uh, a pastor sometimes is called an overseer, a bishop. All those are titles of administration. Listen to me. The head of this church, though, is not Dexter Landers. The head of this church is Jesus Christ. So when we talk about being loyal, we are going to be loyal to the head. The head is Jesus Christ. So this morning, I'm going to give you point two of this message on passion, and I want you to pay very close attention. Let's start off in verse number six. Miss Landers, I'm going to forego the special. Ryan, Ryan's okay with that. He's okay with that. Verse number six, let's read together, if you will. First John 2, verse 6. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. You may have misunderstood me. Let's read that together one more time. Ready? He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Let's go to prayer together. Sam, pray for God's word that it be used today. John chapter 15, if you also flip there, please have your Bible handy here just for probably three quarters of the message. I'm going to look at several different things this morning. Uh, but, but go to John chapter 15. Uh, as we reflect on that, that message of two weeks back, now not necessarily review this morning, uh, but we, we are. We're finding out that if you're going to stay in fellowship with Christ, you have to be loyal to him. Uh, there is a, there's a loyalty. And I bring that word up on purpose there. You'll see some biblical words here in just a moment on it. 
But we understand law. We live in a day where you can't be loyal to nothing. Uh, or the world makes it that way. We get down to verse 15 in 1 John, hopefully in a week or two. I'm going to preach at least through the first two chapters of this book. But when you get down to love in the world, uh, listen, we have folks, they'll, they'll quit a job over 50 cents. We got, we got people, you men and women who own businesses, uh, you, you, uh, you instruct somebody and, and even on the negative side, tell them what they can do and what they cannot do, they'll quit because you got mad at them. There's just, there's just zero loyalty there. There's, just, there's always something greener on the other side, and, and, uh, and, and it's, that's the mentality. So in John chapter 15, uh, I'm going to set the foundation with scriptures before I give you the, 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 the words to write down. This is a very powerful thing we're going to do this morning. But I'm afraid if I don't put the Bible on it, I think you're going to be upset with how I word it just because of the culture. But go to John chapter 15, verse number 1. He says, I am the true vine. And my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, and it may bring forth more fruit. Now, let me just stop here and just set a precedent here. Now, the father can do that because he's in charge. Does that make sense? We're not talking about pruning trees. We're not talking about cutting down fruit trees. Now, that's the analogy. That's the parable. That's the teaching that Jesus is talking about. But he's making it very clear. I can do with my fruit, with whatever I wish, and I can take the branches that bear my fruit and do with whatever I wish. So look at verse 3 with that in mind. Now, ye are clean through the what? The word. So he gets back on track kind of now, going from agriculture to reality. And he's telling us then that our cleanness or, or our ability to fellowship, it is connected with the word. Now, if you're a good Bible student, circle the word word. Circle the word word. Now, I won't have time to go into it, but John chapter 1, verse 1, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. It makes it very clear through those two passages of Scripture. By the way, the same penman, the author of these books are the Spirit of God, but the same penman, the penman comes down and makes it very clear to us that the Word is Jesus Christ. Now say amen right there. Amen. Now that's the Word. Now we often say God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We understand that conversation. But the book of John puts it down on the bottom shelf and lets us know that there is God the Father, there is God the, God the Holy Spirit, and it is true. But in John, he emphasizes Jesus not necessarily as the Son of Man or the Son of God. He is making it clear that Jesus is the Word. Amen. Now listen to me. If we're going to then get to the point where He is the vine, we are the branches... It's evident then that fruit doesn't come until we get clean. We could use the word holy. We could use the word sanctified. There's a lot of biblical words we could use here. But you got to then do it God's way. Can you repeat that with me? you got to do it God's way. Now, once you do it God's way, God then says, hey, then let the peach tree bring peaches. Let the pecan tree bring pecans. Let the apple tree produce apples. You will not produce fruit until you do it God's way. So his way is the word. Pick it up verse number four. Abide in me and I in you. Now here where he says, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. Now read verse five with me. We may, we may bring it back for illustration, but read verse five. Ready? I am the vine, ye are the branches, he that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. So last week we looked, or two weeks ago, we looked at being loyalty, loyal to the head. Number two, write this down. We're going to be loyal to the rule. Loyal to the rule. Now, it's rule singular, not rule plural. Write that down. It's going to make a lot of sense if you'll help me with these notes. Loyalty to the rule. Now, this certain fellowship, the fellowship of Christ, the fellowship of walking with Him, the fellowship of knowing Him, there are guidelines. There is an example. There, how many of you ladies sew? Any ladies still sew in this room? You still sew. Not a whole lot. Some of you do still sew. Now, most of you will sew based upon a what? A pattern. 
You go by a pattern. Now listen to me. Jesus, of course, physically sits on the right-hand throne of God, but he left us his word. He left us his written word. Now it's clear from the scriptures. You don't have to be a Baptist to figure this out. It's clear from the scriptures that then here's the rule. Here's the rule. If I then abide in his word and his word abides in me, then there's a certain production that'll take place. Now, what is it? It's called the fruit in the scriptures, but we know it to be the blessings of God on our life. Now, how many want the blessings of God on your life? Six people? Eight people? You want the blessings of God, correct, on your life. Now, wait now. Then you, write the statement down, you got to be loyal to the rule. If, Every relationship in life has boundaries. I, for some reason, my wife would like me to come home at the evening. You know, I, 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 I don't go great periods of time ever out of the house, but if I ever don't show up at 8 or 9 o'clock, she's going to call. She says, are you okay? Well, I'm okay, but it ain't none of your business. That don't fly in the lander's house much longer. You, you dear folks, God bless you. I love you. I know you get in the ditch every so often or, or you, you know, you, you miss church or whatever. There's a period, you know, if you miss, to, if you, you folks at home listening today, if you miss church today, I ain't going to ring your doorbell tomorrow. But after a couple of weeks, I'm going to at least see if you're living. There's a gentleman that lives in our community, and I don't know that he's ever come to church. I come across him uh, door knocking. My dad really has a large part in his life now. But we go by every single week, me or dad, we knock on the door and just say howdy. Now we do that for one reason. His, vo his daughter lives in Loganville, and she don't expect us, but we just go by and make sure he's still living because he's, he's old enough, but he's still grumpy enough that he don't want nobody taking care of him. So dad, more than me, just goes, knocks on the door, and say, how you doing? And he hadn't figured out that it's his daughter helping or telling us to check on him because if he found out, he probably wouldn't open the door. How many think that's good that my dad would check up on fun? No, no, wait now, wait now. I'm saying there's rules. I'm saying there's guidelines. There's, there's certain expectations in a relationship that need to be kept. And as we look into the things of Christ, there's many things he'd love for you to do. The, the list would be long this morning, and, and it, it would be probably exhaustive. It can be taxing to a Christian that don't understand it or to a Christian that's rebellious in God's will. But when you learn to obey one rule, when you learn to be loyal to one rule, you'll find out that if you're abiding in him, he's abiding in you, and it don't look like a list of rules. It don't sound like a list of legalistic requirements. It sounds like a relationship that loves him, and he loves me. I love him. He loves me. And there's no obligation, none whatsoever. So what are we getting at this morning? We're getting at that if I then will be loyal to this rule, what will it do for me? Here's where I'm getting at this morning. If we're loyal to the head, that means you've got to be obedient to the head. What does it mean be loyal to a rule? It's this one word. Write it down. It's imitation. It's imitation. Now, I use the word imitation. I want you to quickly, if you will, go to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. And I'm going to give you what I think is the hook of the message or the thing to concentrate on, and then I'm going to explain why in just a moment. But in Ephesians chapter number 5, I want you to see this great principle here that I think is just dynamic. It's just, of course, it's a truth. Why would I say principle? It's just a dynamic truth. But Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, and this is why humanists look at Jesus as being egotistical, this is why they look at Jesus as being a, a maniac with his ego. Uh, the fact of the matter is they don't know Christ. And when a man's that good, it ain't his fault he's that good. You understand God is God. I mean, I ought to be preaching to the choir right now. And you ought to know yeah, he's high, holy, lifted up. So then when we talk about being loyal to a rule, we need some people here this morning to quit taking it as a suggestion. 
So, so look, at, look, look at verse number 1 of Ephesians chapter 5. And, and let's read just verse 1 together. Verse 1 and 2 goes together. But look at just verse 1. Read it with me, Ralph. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. And then, of course, he gives us what we ought to do. Now, now follow this very carefully. Does anybody have any idea of what the word be followers means? It means be imitators. Now, I, 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 I don't try on purpose to bring controversy to a pulpit. Because I don't think much of the controversy that takes place in the, in the Christian world needs to be barked over here all the time. But we live in the day where the Spirit is all about innovation. Does this make sense? We, if I can example here for a second, we live in a day where a man and woman can't wait until the baby's born to find out the sex of their child. You know, I, I'm not preaching to you either, Bobby. Yeah, I'm not. Man, we couldn't do it. We found out. We, there was inside of us. We're going to wait. The ultrasound, do y'all want to know? And we're looking at you. Yes, what is it? But we live in a day where everything's about, hey, I got a better reveal party, I have a better baby shower, I have a better this. Now, I'm not faulting all those things. Don't, don't look at it. That. But we live in that spirit of innovation. In the church world, we're trying to see what the world wants to bring it into the church rather than tell the world what the church demands. And therefore, there's this great jail of confusion that takes place, especially in church circles. And it's all about the band. It's all about about the lights, it's all about the contour of the body or the, 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 the building, it's about the pleasure of the building. Now, we, we are not old-fashioned in relation to outhouses, but church is not about the look, it's about the word. So follow me very carefully here. The goal then, especially men my age, there's, and maybe it's because it's my community, but there's more preachers my age that preach like me when I was 20 that have gotten off the old gospel ship, you know what I mean, the old paths, the old way. And, and again, I'm not trying to honor just that system, but, but they've got out of it because if you stick with this, then nobody come to church. If you, if you teach the teenagers how to be holy and pure, rather, folks, there are literally churches. I know you don't get out a whole lot, but Wednesday night the adults are here and the children are generally in the basement playing video games. I'm just telling you that's the way it happens, and I'm not trying to beat a dead horse. I'm just telling you it's that innovation spirit. And listen, there will be a day where the lights will be gone again. There will be a day they'll, they'll do something different. They'll do something different. But Mount Zion Baptist Church has got a track history, and I'm not parading us this morning, but for 160-plus years, this church has made the preaching of the Bible the most, com most important component that happens at church. Amen. Now, what is that? Here's the statement I want you to write down. We don't need to be innovators. We need to be imitators. Can I just give you a great example here, and I don't have time to get into it. Who's supposed to teach the young people in the church? Who's supposed to teach them? The older people. 99% of the churches that look like us, steeple up front, little old white building, Again, I'm not trying to be mean. But if you're in church today around this community, you're going to go to a church that has 30 people. And those 30 people are going to look in the neighborhood of 60 and older. Where's the young people? They're gone to the churches of innovation. They're going to the churches where it's cool. They're going to the churches where I can have fun. They're going to the churches where I can relate. Now listen to me. I understand personality. I understand and get it on somebody's level. But a person will never have God's blessings on their life unless they're connected with this rule. And what's the rule? Loyalty to the word. Let me give you three little thoughts here real quick. I think it'll be helpful to you. First of all, imitation is the key for the right order. 
Now, when I say key to the right order, and I won't expound too long in here, but John chapter 15 gets into the term abide. Gets into the abide. Again, not to be super critical, but when fun is the focus or when building relationships is the focus, when, 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 when preaching, I, I, of course, I don't want to crush anybody's opinion about somebody that has inspired you, but just about all the telev television preachers uh, get up and tell you how good you can feel. They'll tell you how you can be inspired. Very little TV preaching, national TV preaching, is not done with a Bible verse by verse telling you how bad the devil is, how worse it's going to get if you stay with him and stick with the Word. It's a motivational self-help which may help you with your income, which may help you with your, with your vision of health, but it's not going to produce a lick of blessing because God only blesses his word Amen. so the imitation starts this way what are you talking about preacher it sounds simple but you got to be saved first inspired second I it was it, it, of course Joel Osteen went up with Joel Osteen if you're familiar with him he's probably the probably the largest uh, he goes on television national television on a couple of times in the last four or five years and the question of not trusting Jesus sends you to hell, it has been skirted around to where you don't know what takes place. Do you make sense? The very next week, uh, Franklin Graham's sister, Billy Graham's daughter, goes on the same television show. She looks right in the camera and says, if you don't trust Jesus, you're going to die and go to hell. Do, do, do you see what I'm saying? I'm not trying to build an opinion of who you should or should not conversate or relate around. I'm just simply saying, if we're going to imitate the Word, if we're going to set the pattern, if we're going to be followers of Jesus, Jesus set this thing out in the right order. Go to Ephesians chapter 2, if you would, please. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Ephesians chapter number 2. In verse number one, this is uh, Tom Williams. I heard him preach Miss Sunshine's funeral on Tuesday up at Whitley um, Rosehaven, Rosehaven, and uh, he again made the, again he made the statement that eighty percent of Baptist churches, eighty percent of Baptist churches will die and go to hell. Eighty percent, and I've heard that for a long time, and I sit and scratch my nose about that, which means eighty percent are tares. It means eighty percent are following tradition. It means that eighty percent are following mom and dad. It means eighty percent have got into a rut, heritage. Now, what I, why, did, why did he say that? He clarifies the statement by letting them know is that people have followed religion and not Jesus Christ. That ought to cause you to get worried this morning. If Brother Williams is right and he's not wrong about a whole lot of stuff, 80% of the people sitting here are going to die and go to hell. Why? Because you're imitating something else that probably has qualities, but it is he that is the door and nobody else. So the rule comes into play. That rule says that we ought to abide in him. So Ephesians chapter 2, look at verse, no, did I give that to you already? I gave it to you. Ephesians chapter 2. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. I gave it to y'all already, didn't I? Man, I done got Go to verse number 2 is where I'm headed. Ephesians chapter 2. And then look at verse number 2. No, verse 1. I didn't give it to you. I gave you chapter 4, I think. And you hath he quickened. Now look what it says there. You hath he quickened. Do y'all understand that he saved? Do you understand he justified you? He redeemed you? That's what that means. And you hath he quickened who were what? Now listen, to me. You, don't, you don't become alive by works. You, you, you don't become alive by help. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2 is about discipleship. And Paul tells young Timothy that he ought to find young people who will follow him because he follows Christ and they'll be able to teach others also. Now I'm paraphrasing there. That is a principle that is misunderstood when it comes to salvation among religion. It's the principle of the saved. And yes, you young Christians better attach yourself to an older Christian and you older Christian better point them to Jesus and not 
not to yourself. But that don't work for salvation. Salvation, we imitate Christ. What is it? It's the death, burial, and the resurrection. It's the gospel. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of Christ. What I'm saying this morning, if your fellowship is going to have this loyalty to the certain set of rules, then you got to live your life by imitation. you got to follow Jesus Christ. Number two, write this down. The imitation then must be regulated in the right manner. Now, there's a right order. There's a right order. I asked you to uh, pray for Paul. This morning. What if Paul's watching? I hope he's watching. But I preached this morning with the expectation that Paul would be here. And I was going to spend 20 minutes of my message on point one in hopes that he would get born again. And understand that salvation's not the order of baptism, good works, then trust. No, it's trust alone. Then, hey, by the way, if you're not on the branch, you're in trouble. Or if you're not on the vine, you're in trouble. Amen. You only become a branch when you put your life in Christ. That's how you become the branch. But number two, imitation, this must be regulated. Now, jot down these three verses. I won't turn there. But Luke 2.51, Acts 10.38, and Luke 9.51. Now, all three of these has a progression of Jesus' life. The first one in Luke chapter 2 there deals with him being at the temple must I not be about my father's business? You get these 12 years of age. Acts chapter 10, verse 38 there then deals with, it talks about how Jesus went about his whole life doing good. How many think he did good from 12 to 30? Oh, you know he did good. I know those are the, uh, what we call them, the, I forget what those years are called. They call them in uh, commentaries. But, but those are the years that we don't know anything about Jesus. There's, there's nothing recorded about those years. But I'm telling you, he went around doing good every day of his life. He's getting, I say better and better, don't misquote that, but he's growing in statute. He's always been God. That's where the Mormons has got it wrong. He eventually became God. He was God before conception, during conception, after conception. He's always been God, amen. But do you understand what Christ is doing? There's a certain order that's happening in his life. There's some things that are being marked out. See, there's an imitation that we then uh, regulate in the right manner, and that manner goes back to the headship of who he is, but we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Guess who you imitate then? You imitate Jesus. All you daddies, if, I, if you'd be honest with me, not publicly now. Every one of you daddies got a will that you want your children to follow. I mean, if you sit and ask me right now, preacher, tell us your inner thoughts about what you want your boys to do. I wouldn't mind talking with you about it with coffee, but, you know, I don't want my kids to hear it. I, I, one, of my, one of my worst fears in my life, I'm, I mean this, I get choked up thinking about it. I'd hate for them, the kids, to be so underneath my hand that they miss God's will. You, you don't know how hard it is for me to say that. You, you, you don't understand how hard that is for me to say that. But I feel it's necessary to bring it to you this morning to help you to understand it will be that way if I create headship with them. You, you know one thing that scares me about our church is that you'll fall in love with me and not the Lord. There, there's, there's. Can I tell you why I like a growing church? It's all philosophical now. But with a growing church, I can't take time with all of you. Can I tell you something that may go to the quick this morning? I don't need to take time with all of you. Please don't take that wrong. Please don't take that wrong. If my preaching and leadership does not push you to Christ, I ain't a good pastor. Fellowship is wonderful. And it, you teenagers, y'all know I love the teenagers. I love them. I, I like going with them. And uh, our, you folks that are visitors, I, we don't have a full time youth pastor. Brother Coward can't take off and take these kids everywhere. He's got a job. 
so I'm full time. Uh, a couple of men that are uh, self-employed help me sometimes. I, my only, mainly these ladies. I think we took what, 700 women with us. <laughs> that trailer pulling them bags felt like a lot of women. But uh, couldn't do it without them. But we get to sit down. We wake up in the morning. We're eating breakfast together. We go to bed at 11 o'clock at night. They see the preacher in a whole different manner. And, and, and I, you young people, that ain't life. It ain't real life. You don't get to do that every day of your life. And it's probably good for them to see the pastor with his hair undone and, you know, without a tie ever so often. And, uh, you know, we pull over and you got to go to the bathroom and I'm screaming, why can't they wake six more exits? And, You don't need to imitate me. Respect me and honor me. And I mean, those are in the Bible. It's even hard for me to say those things to you because I don't want you to do it out of necessity. But you'll find out in those, just those three verses Luke 2 51, Acts 10 38, and then Luke 10 51. You'll find out that the Lord is perfectly wonderful. Go to Psalms 119. I want to show you something interesting here. Psalms 119, then I got to move. We're about done. Psalms 119. Psalms 119, go to verse 33. Psalms 119 and verse number 33. Psalms 119, verse 33. Now watch this. I'll read it. Oh, this is lovely. Psalms 119, if you did not know, it's all about the Word of God. Every, every All 165 verses of it. But in Psalms 119, verse 33, watch it now as I read it. Teach me, O Lord. This is why I prefer you stick with the King James and no other version. This is the word thy. You ain't thy, these, and thou. We don't talk that way no more, but listen to me. It's honorable. It's holy. It's a, just an elevated language. It ain't y'all and yep. And it's just good stuff. He says thy thy statutes and I shall keep it unto the end verse 34 give me understanding and I shall keep look what he says thy law now it goes on and on and I could stay with that segment of 119 but I want you to understand the imitation is regulated in a right manner hey can I just be can I just be plain with you just because me and you get at odds don't mean that you and Christ should get at odds. Hey, hey, can I say this? And there's, there's several people out traveling and stuff. But this morning, if me and you get opposite on our personalities and you lead this church, that's weak on your part. Did you hear me? Weak on your part. Hey, listen to me. We ain't intimidating or we ain't imitating each other. We imitating Jesus Christ. Oh, third one. Watch this. Here's the best one. Here's the third one. Go back to 1 John chapter 2. Go back to 1 John chapter number 2. He that saith he abideth in him. Now look what the Bible says here. Alt himself. Alt himself. Also so to walk. Now circle the word alt if you didn't get it. The word here alt should be interpreted this way. And again, here's a little sliver of my opinion. It should be interpreted this way. I can. If you, hey, hey this room is very small. There's very little room for talking. Very little room for talking and stuff. Be, be, be patient. If Christ says you ought to do something, you have the ability A person would innovate. You understand technology, right? How many think we thank God we got that bathroom inside? Amen. That's innovation. I'm not balking at technology. This is not a message balking against social media. I'm not saying that. Innovators push forward because there's things that are wrong. Or it could be better. Everybody thinking with me? 
So catch this. You can't improve on Jesus. You can't improve on Jesus. Look at verse 15 right now. You look at it. Love not the what? Here in just a couple weeks, when we get down to that verse, you are not going to like your pastor. I, because I'm going to preach the Bible the way it should be preached. And in the, maybe two weeks, either you're going to love Christ or you're going to hate him. Innovators don't like that verse. Because if we can change the world, we can change how church is done. No, listen to me. Don't change church, but change the world. Did you catch that? You ain't got to change your Christianity to change the world. You change the world with Christianity. It's powerful. It's powerful. So then, then what are we looking at? Third of all, third of all, write this down. The imitation then can be achieved in the right strength. So as he says that we ought, we ought, it's not a question mark of if we can. It's a matter of, yes, you can, but it's generally done in the wrong strength. Listen to me. You'll never do God's work in your own power, in your own mind, in your own ideas. It's always done with the right power. Now, what is it? It's the power of the Holy Spirit. So jot down Galatians chapter 5. Don't turn there. Galatians chapter 5 then talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Even up until probably yeah, eight years ago maybe, I often would read John 15 with one idea, with one idea, soul winning. Now, I don't think I have been wrong with putting soul winning into the mixture because definitely if you're abiding in Christ, and Christ is abiding you, it's going to rub off on somebody else. That's, that's just the truth. But if you go and study Galatians chapter 5 about the fruits of the Spirit, it tells you about love, joy, peace. It goes through all those. And against such there is no law. The blessings of God has more to do than bringing somebody to church and seeing their life discipled in, in Christ. I'm going to tell you right now, I want the fruit of God to come out of my children. I want the fruit of God to come out in my, in my walk with God. How many believe there's things today that you ought to do and you have a hard time doing them? Yeah, I do. Can I tell you why we have a hard time? Because we're not imitating the Lord. Anybody just have the, our teenagers had a good week. Oh, several of them have texted me. You, you ladies have texted me. Preacher, thank you for that week. We just had a great week. It was a great week, but we wasn't great. No, we didn't steal nothing or break no windows. We don't. I, but when you wake up in the morning, you're headed out to the van at 730, and you look at a you know, teenage girl and say, how's it going? And they don't smile back. Don't ask again. I'm not a morning person. I can tell. <laughs> Didn't say we were perfect. But then the next morning, a young girl gets, she gets preached, time, preached at two or three times during the week, and you walk in, you got a cup of coffee, and say, is it any better day? Oh, it's way better day. Thank you, preacher. I'm sorry for yesterday. Oh, I, I, didn't, I didn't think you need to apologize. Man, it's a good day. That was a good sermon. Wasn't it like last night? So it was a good sermon. Okay. What happened to her? She sat and heard. A preacher talk about the best preacher, Jesus. <laughs> she heard a sinner tell another sinner where to get bread. She heard another person talking about perfection who wasn't perfect but taught us how to all get perfect. Who's perfect? Jesus. Amen. See, through the Spirit of God, you can go a day without anger and wrath and malice and the works of the flesh, which is above the fruit works of the Spirit. But it's not. You, you men, and you know, you know men, I, you, I love you. How many of you men got the, some texts from me, you know, over the years, and you don't text me back because you don't want to be challenged? 
men, I challenge you, and I will continue to challenge you with verses and Bible reading, and we're having soul winning, and I want you to come, and you don't come. I don't hate you if you don't come. I'm just challenging you. But if you keep measuring your life by me, you're going to fail. You better be marking that thing by Jesus. Loyalty to the head. But loyalty to the rule. So here's the rule. What is it? In the morning, you need to get up and read your Bible. Do it Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Sleep in a little bit. You men that run your businesses. But get up and read the Bible. Spend two minutes in prayer, three minutes in prayer, day off, spend ten minutes in prayer. Just keep working at it. Just keep working on it. Preacher, what's that going to do? Well, give it 14 days. Uh, you better listen to me now. I've been in this for a long time. Your marriage gets better. Sell way more pallets. I, I, I mean, Brother and Mrs. Hall, y'all might make it 75 years. Yeah. He gets up every morning. I know that man's schedule. You follow me? That's, it's, that's all it is? Yeah, it's an imitation. We independent Baptists thought that up, right? Oh, no. Oh, no. No, no, no. We've just been trying to follow it. Man, everything, like your relationship with your kids changes. Date night gets better. She kisses way better when she reads her Bible. Ain't that the truth? <laughs> Can I get an amen? amen? Devin, you might find a good-looking girl if you keep reading your Bible. Uh, no, no pressure, sir. No pressure. Does everybody understand what the imitation is? Just imitate. Father, I pray you'll bless us this morning. I, I thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about you. Lord, my life is right when I started off with you every day. I have some hiccups, I have frustrations, but I know how to deal with them. I know how to be patient with people because you've been patient with me. I thank you. Lord, I pray for somebody here this morning that thinks they're saved, but they're not for certain. They have no assurance of their salvation. I pray that today would be the last day that they have a doubt. I pray for that. God, just bless us. Bless those who are saved here this morning. Lord, help them understand that they've got to imitate the Lord. They've got to imitate Him. They've got to imitate His rules. I pray you'll bless them, Father. Help them understand. Lord, my broken English, and my thoughts get jumbled up many a times. I pray they'll listen through this old voice. They heard the love of God today and the expectation from our Savior. I pray they'll hear it this morning. Please bless us. Please bless us. The instruments are going to play. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Who'd say, preacher, this morning, I'm saved. I'm born again. If I died today, I'd go to heaven. Can I see your hand? Anybody, anybody thankful for that? Are you? Come on, don't be ashamed. Put it up. Young people, you're hearing me. I know you're hearing me. Come on. All right, hands down. Preacher, I, I could get a little bit more, more loyal to Jesus. I could get a little bit more. There's room in my life where I could grow a little bit more loyal to him. And I could start imitating him a little bit more than my friends and activities in Hollywood. I, I could really imitate him a little bit more. Who say, preacher, that's me this morning. You helped me with that. Would you lift your hand? Would you lift it? Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. Oh, God bless you. God bless you. Would you stand with us, please? Brother Goucher is about to sing a song. If you raise your hand, I want you to come to this altar and thank God you're saved. I want you to come and tell Jesus, Jesus, I've not been reading the Bible or may I have been praying or I don't know, but you come make a commitment right now. Come on. Come on, make a commitment right now. Young and old, it don't matter. If these young people don't follow Christ, they'll turn into these, you know, these stars of yesteryear. So Hollywood will sell them a cheap version of the truth. Before you know it, they'll go live in Nashville and try to be a music star when they should have stayed in their local church and sang for Jesus. I mean, that stuff really happens, y'all. It really happens. That's it. That's right. That's right. Take your time. There's no rush. There's no rush.
imitate Christ. She said, Preacher, I'll never get perfect at this. Friend, you're right. We'll never get perfect at it. There's a, there's a great verse that I'm, I want to preach soon. I just never had peace about it. But you know, I preached those chapters in James just for a short time, a couple months ago. And I never went past chapter 2. But as we get into the book of James, there's this wonderful verse about drawing nigh to God. And he'll draw nigh to you. It really is. It's that old picture of, of someone being over there, and as I take a step, they take a step. And, 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 and I've been told by some very wise men, preacher, about the last day of your life, if you've walked with God, you'll be so close to touch Him. This is why I've read some books on dying saints. Pacific preacher I know in Georgia, I won't call his name, he's dead now. But his children got him on video, and, and I know his children, and, and they will not release them tapes for nothing. That's just for their personal, and I understand that. So I've always heard the story. I asked his son probably a year ago about it. And he said, Bro Lanz, it's true. And when his dad was dying, he named his kids. He said, Can't y'all see it? It's just right over there. And this guy loved horses now, and he loved horses. And he called his son's name. He said, can't you see them ponies? And his son told me, he said, he said, we, we sat there and was crying, me and my sisters. We were crying with Dad. And, and we said, Dad, yeah, it's got to be over there. That dear saint of God said in years prior about a message about the book of James drawing nigh to God. And then he was in his 60s. He said, every year of my life, he gets closer. And he gets closer. See, we want to have that experience when we're 20. It ain't going to happen until you die. But your whole life, you're like Abraham, been looking for a city that nobody else can see. See, that's why they sing about heaven. You young people, listen to me. That's why you see these folks that are over 65, when you hear songs on heaven, they don't listen, boy, they know what it's about. They ain't too far there, and they got a mom and daddy that's there, and they got a preacher that's there. It's real. See, the trick is, try to imitate him here, rather than wait till you get there. And see, every older saint right now, I told you about Brother Hall, he reads his Bible. But I wish you could do it. I bet you wish you could do it more when you were younger. See, it gets sweeter as the days go by. And every so often, you young people, there's a young person that gets it because they're searching and they're not waiting until they get old. You ain't got to be 60 to love the Lord. You can be 14. And you can but so want God so bad. Uh, let, let me tell you this too, and I'm done. When I got called to preach, there is no way to tell a young boy how to cool it down. You don't want to throw fire or cold water on some young man's fire. But there's an older preacher in my life, dead now, but I'm 16 of eight, years of age. There's a specific preacher that I fell in love with. I mean, I fell in love love with I read every book that he had I think I've listened to every CD that's out there cassette tape then we're walking out of church it's a retired preacher was in our church and they called me Bubba he said Bubba can I have a word with you I said yes sir he had heard me preach a little old service you know like preachers do he said can I help you and I said yes he said well, I'm about to hell you it might make you upset and I said go ahead man you tell me what you ever want he said, listen, I love that preacher too you're talking about. He said, but that preacher's going to upset you one day. And you're going to have to learn to follow Christ. That preacher upset me in my life. And I don't hate him. I ain't going to badmouth him. Because I've been following down the one that he did follow. Imitate Christ. And even imitate his rules. 
you'll find out you'll have a pleased and balanced life. Be a good life. Amen. Good to have you today. Don't miss choir practice. Please don't miss team uh, meeting. Brother Coward, are you on today? Okay. Brother Coward's on today with you young people. Y'all have a great time, and the Lord enjoy the weather. Be back tonight at 5 o'clock. I make a huge announcement about discipleship. I've got three more weeks of it. Dick and Jan Beery was with me last night at 5 o'clock, and uh, I've got two more meetings left with that. If you want to be a discipler now, this is a discipler. I cannot let you disciple without going through some of the administration things. And so you need to pay attention to some of those things. So that'll be two more weeks. But tonight I give you a great detailed announcement. And uh, I'm really looking forward. We have 12 people who are ready to go involved with discipleship. So we're about three weeks away from literally just giving you, getting you out the gate and then letting God, you and God work on people. And so we'll see how that goes. But don't miss tonight. Great message. Looking forward to it. And uh, you're just going to have a great time in the Lord. When you come back today, we're going to set up our prayer, our drive-in prayer up here in the front. And we're going to show you a physical demonstration of what we're going to begin to do next Saturday. And uh, we are looking for about 10 teenagers or adults. I, gotta have, I can't have kids. But we're going to put a tent out on one of these public roadways. And then we're going to ask people to pull off the highway, come into a tent, and let's have prayer together. And so we'll try to demonstrate it this afternoon if I can get the tent out in time and, and hang up some banners and stuff. We'll, we'll show you that today. Uh, but got a lot of things coming up, a lot of good things coming up here at the church. And uh, we're thankful for the opportunity that we're going to get the gospel out. Get the gospel out. That's what it's all about. So good to see you. I'll, see, I'll be out front, me and my wife, shaking your hands. You can't exit today. Uh, the, bapt uh, the Spanish ministry has baptisms this afternoon. That's a, that's a blessing. They'll be baptizing here about 3 o'clock. And so we're excited for them. But... Just a good day in the Lord. Just a good day in the Lord. Brother Mark, ask God to give us our give us grace to get home and be back and but dismiss us in prayer, please.
Well, good evening and welcome to Mount Zion Baptist Church. Let's stand. Stretch those legs a little bit. Turn in your songbook, if you would, to page number 490. Page 490. Revive us again. after the last verse sing amen all right let it rip man like you're doing a church service all right here we go ready all right revive us again fill each heart with my love Let's go in prayer, if you would, please. Maybe make a knee where you're at, if you like. Remain standing. There's no disgrace in that. But let's ask God to work in our service tonight. Uh, got an update on John Barr. John Barr's at home doing well. He does confirm that he has the old seasonal flu, and uh, he does have pneumonia. Please pray for John. They have loaded him with some antibiotics. Let's pray that works, would you please? And uh, we need John back in church. And uh, it's not time to... Say why, I guess, but let's just pray for our brother. Let's just pray for him, so remember that. Well, let's go to prayer, if you would, please. I'm going to go to my knee and pray for a little bit, but let's ask God to do amazing work tonight in our church. Begin to pray now, if you would. Say it. Amen. Amen. Y'all be seated.
let's stand one more time. Take your songbooks and turn to page number 323, Standing on the Promises, page 323. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. In, uh, through the church, there's been a couple things passed out. Uh, this green sheet there, just just take that, put it in your Bible. It has nothing to do with the message or anything tonight. Uh, but those who are interested in helping me with discipleship, it's just a handout that I think that'll help you. But it, how did Jesus make disciple makers? And uh, so please look at that if you would, please. Uh, the handout that was given in Sunday school about cults. Uh, there are several in the back, if I know not everybody got one this morning. Please go by and get that. Now, it's not an informative sheet from A to Z about cults, but it tells you some of their beliefs, their, uh, their doctrine, uh, but it's a tool to help you how to witness to them. So just let's leave it there, Brother Beer. If they want it, they come get it. And, uh, but I, uh, I want you to get that. It's a great witnessing tool. It's a great witnessing tool, uh, and that will be a help to you. There is a study guide tonight to the message, uh, just because I want you to write a couple of things down and then, then have some verses. So does anybody not have that study guide? Anybody not have it? Right there, Miss Denise doesn't have it. Anybody else? Miss uh, Teresa needs one. If you can read and write, I'd like for you to have it, okay? And uh, young people, I don't want you to draw stick men tonight. And uh, ladies, don't do your grocery shopping list tonight. And what else happens with a pen and paper tonight? Emma, you and Christian do not play tic-tac-toe tonight. Anyway, back to the study. And uh, I, I got them, man. I got them, brother. And, uh, but we uh, but get that study. I want you to have it. And... Um, Good. I did not mention Jim Newell today. I apologize for not mentioning that during prayer. Jim Newell is confirmed having the coronavirus, and uh, Brother Ovid called us. He's down in Florida. Brother Ovid at the memorial service, his brother. Remember, his brother passed away several months ago, and they are now just down to do the memorial service. Um, but Brother Jim has COVID, and he is weak. Um, Brother uh, Ovid texted me today that he's having a hard time even getting in a wheelchair physically. He said, Let's pray for him. Let's pray for him. And at this moment, it's not serious enough to go to the doctor, uh, but he's, he's quarantined at the house. And so I don't know what he's on as far as medicine. I don't know. I don't know. I'll find out in the morning. Uh, but let's lift Brother Jim up. Let's lift up Brother Jim. And uh, so let's pray for him, if you would, please. I'd appreciate that. And then let me give you the last announcement. It's too windy to put the tent up. I didn't have the stakes to keep them down. But starting Saturday morning, our goal is to have at least eight people. And so I think we have seven or eight signs, 
and uh, we don't have to have all of those unless the county stops us we're putting this tent up at the roundabout and so it'll be a 10 by 10 tent old pop-up tent y'all have seen that underneath it we'll have a table we'll have a couple folding chairs there and um, there's two banners that go on the tent that says drive up prayer be facing the highway and then what we need is some people that just stand around the roundabout you don't have to say a word you don't have to say a word but you're going to hold these signs up and what we're going to do is try to point them to the tent and as they come to the tent i'd like to have we'd like to have at least two i'd really like to have at least two and uh, if we could get four would be fine but all you're going to do is go to the car. They're not going to get out. You're going to give them a prayer request. We want them to fill it out. It have name, address. You're going to ask them what their need is, and then you're going to pray with them. That's all you're going to do. After prayer, you're going to introduce yourself to them, and then you're going to try to win them to Christ. If you do not win them to Christ, we have name, we have phone number, we have burden, we have need. That's all we're trying to do. And uh, we, again, we live in a world where everybody is nervous about things. It doesn't mean that the gospel has to stop. Uh, Lloyd Latham was leaving the service one Sunday morning here, and uh, he looked at me and he said, you like evangelism, don't you? And I said, I love it. I love it. So Brother Lloyd looked at me and said, hey, let me give you an idea. This is a perimeter of the idea he gave me. And so I called him the uh, day after and got the details of his mind. He said, man, I ain't got no details. Just, just hold a sign up. Your daddy does. <laughs> See if they'll come pray with you. And so we got to praying about me and dad and uh, gave it a couple of days of prayer. And we sat down with a pencil and paper and thought, how could we make this thing convenient? Brother and Mrs. Ovid, they're the first to sign up. They said, sign us up. We can sit in a chair. That's easy. And uh, so... Help us if you would, please. Teenagers, I, we don't have necessarily anything going on for on Saturdays. And moms and dads, maybe they could help us a little bit on this, hold a sign. Um, I do not want children out there unless they're with an adult. And um, But our goal is to take this at least every other week and put it, put it here. I spoke with Kroger a couple of days ago, the manager. They've not got back with me yet, but we hope to put it in the corner of Kroger parking lot. And uh, we spoke with Walmart. We want to put this in the corner of Walmart. Let the homeless people stand there. Maybe they let us sit there. And uh, so we're just trying to get the gospel out. There's nothing that says Mount Zion Baptist about this. There's nothing. Uh, of course, we'll give them some gospel literature and so forth. And uh, someone gets saved. They need a good church to go to. Uh, but we're just trying to get the gospel out. That's all we're trying to. Would you, would you help us think about it? See Dad tonight if you can. And uh, then we'll get going. We'll try to have the tent set up on Wednesday night so you'll see, depending on the weather. Um, but we'll see, let you see those things. So does that make sense? Just hold a sign and smile for Jesus. That's about all you got to do. So amen. Ushers, would you come, please? Let's take our offering. Brother Goucher, what page number? 275. Get your hymn. No, we're going to let you be seated. Page 275. And uh, let's get into another song. Of course, we'll take our offering up tonight. I appreciate you giving. A lot of it comes through online giving now. I know the deacons appreciate the less counting time. And uh, Miss, uh, Miss Teresa likes it, too. It's don't have to handle money, you know. And so uh, we appreciate that. And I think we've had less bank fees, less checks sent back. That's always a blessing, amen. And... Uh, but appreciate you getting involved with that. Preacher, what do you prefer? I prefer you drop it in the plate. That's what I prefer. But however we can get it from you, we're Baptists. We'll take it. Amen. We appreciate you. I, look, Lord's blessing. There's a lot of good things going on in our church. And uh, uh, time would not allow us to tell you about all of them. We're just, we're just thankful for it. And uh, uh, we appreciate you being faithful. The issue is not what you give. You get that? Yes. The issue is you being faithful. And... Uh, no giver ought to ever be applauded. Right? right? That's the truth. God's making those notes up in heaven. And he'll reward you publicly. You, and he does, does he not? Oh, does he ever? Well, let's go to prayer. Brother Micah, pray for us, please.
You take your songbooks again, turn to page 275. Page 275, it is well with my soul. come sing the boys that came to the conference up in Kentucky. Miss Landers play just a little bit. I want to take just a moment. We had a good group go. There's adults that went and uh, but I'd like to take just a second give these boys an opportunity to testify and uh, girls if y'all like to y'all y'all come or stand where you're at and uh, we just had a good time. It's it's uh, it's it's awful easy going somewhere when when the kids don't give you trouble. Um, you know, they're kids. They have a good time. They enjoy fellowship with one another. But they don't come with an agenda. I, my first trip I ever had here, um, I take, uh, I don't know, it was, it was a van load. We get up to Indiana. We're there on a turnpike. I'm there at a little restaurant. And uh, I asked a young boy, a uh, young boy rode the bus here. I asked him not to do something, and he kept doing it and doing it. Finally, I said, hey. I'm not going to ask you again. He jumps the fence, comes running down the turnpike. I'm responsible for him. I chase him down. It was. I get him to a pay phone. That's how old this was. Yeah. We call his dad. You know, I give the parents all the information. His, his oldest son, this guy's oldest brother, calls me, curses me up one downside the other. We get back to Whitesburg, Georgia. They ain't ever coming back to church. At that point, I said, please don't ever come back. And his dad pulls up here one day, and we're having a conversation, and his son ran off from him. Them boys, thank God, them twin boys, you folks know who they are. Micah should know who they are. He's the one that brought them. No, I'm kidding. And uh, 
But he said, Preacher, we should have listened to you that night when you were up in Indiana. We should listen to you. He said, Our son's giving us a heart trouble. And, um, you know, we've had those experiences. Other than tell them to get out of bed, that's about as hard as it was, you know. That was it. I appreciate you adults and uh, appreciate the church. Church took care of a little bit of the funds. Uh, they all worked and paid most their own way. And uh, But we just had a good time. We're coming home. It's uh, it's probably 8.30. I'm getting off Red Top Mountain, and these boys sing from Red Top Mountain all the way to church. And I said, boys, I want y'all to sing. I want y'all to sing together. They're gonna, acapella? Y'all going to do it acapella? They're going to do acapella. So, but y'all do, come up here if you got a minute to testify. They all walked the aisles, the little bit of aisle that we had. There was a thousand teenagers there, a thousand teenagers preaching. They probably heard probably seven or eight sermons. Uh, they had a good old time. Our, our young people about won the Bible quiz, Luke, Allie, Ryan, and Sam. That's a coveted thing there, just... Dozens of churches. Our boys won the basketball competition out of 64 churches. That was pretty neat. Uh, they just had a lot of fun, a lot of good mixture. Uh, we challenged you to pray for them, our safety and different things. But, God, there's some things that happen that they'll never forget. They'll never forget. They made memories, and uh, but they just had a good time. Boys, y'all testify. Give the girls a chance if they like. And if not, y'all sing, and then we'll get into the Bible. We'll get into the Bible. Uh, there was a message with Dave Smith. He came here a couple years ago and um, talks about there was the the uh, theme of that was a Western theme, a wanted, dead, and alive. And he kind of went with the theme a little bit, called it a stay in the saddle, and how he's a big, uh, he runs a camp down there, just a big cowboy fan, and he was teaching how, when you put the saddle on a horse, and there's all kinds of stuff you got to take care of before you get on the horse, as far as the blanket and the saddle and the stirrups and all kinds of stuff he's going into. The part I like best was if you don't put the blanket on right and use the blanket of salvation, the first you got to get your salvation settled. You got to put it on there before you can put all the other stuff serving the Lord. But uh, the uh, big round part in the front of the saddle, if you don't get the blanket right it, when you ride it, it'll keep pounding against the uh, against against the horse, and then there'll be a it would get so bad there'd be some kind of worm that I don't know how he, he explained it better than anybody can. But this big old worm and it makes the horse not ride well. It makes it get infected. And how our life, when our life goes, when we don't put the salvation on first, and we try to do everything our own way, when we try to uh, kind of like fake our salvation, you know, everything looks the best, but our heart's not right. It keeps hitting and hitting it before long. Everybody knows that you weren't right. Everybody knows that you were something was wrong with you. And at the end, it reminded me of my salvation. For a while, I was—I uh, thought I was saved, but I never could get it settled. And two years ago, I got it settled, and now my life is uh, the worms out. You could say the worms out of my uh, back. You can say that, but I just—I just like that message he said. Uh, I, I can't—I couldn't tell you one sermon that I liked other than the other. They were all tremendous, every single one of them. And uh, for if it was really to me, I would predict it as like a shotgun uh, conference. Everything, all the way from salvation. Uh, to the most wicked sin of, of, of homosexuality and all that kind of stuff. It hit everybody square. You couldn't go to that conference and say that nothing there applied to me. And uh, But every message had something. But uh, one of the biggest messages that applied to my life was uh, Brother Davis preached on uh, high noon at the witch's house. I told somebody that today, and they looked at me with something a funny uh, face. But I do have to say that that was a good message about how every day in every life, uh, every day Saul had one day left to live. And uh, the, the, the witch there told him that. And he used it in, in the wrong and wrong way. And you saw uh, Saul of the king uh, didn't do what God wanted him to. And a reminder that every day, uh, if you live every day uh, for God, eventually after you look at your whole life, you'll see that it's a lifestyle. And you, you've lived for God your entire life. And, and that was good just for me growing up in church, um, realizing that every day it's, it's like this. But And then Brother Dallas preached on remembering the one that, that you serve. And don't become too familiar with Jesus Christ. Uh, remember what he did for you, and it was just, it was a wonderful conference all the way around, but I, I really appreciate it. Um, I went there, and the uh, Lord worked on me. I sometimes get too comfortable with our own church, and sometimes don't enjoy going to other churches because I just get so used to everything here because it usually stays the same and is comfortable, but he worked on me about being okay with going to other churches and hearing something that sounds a little bit different or they 
tell a little bit different joke and <laughs> to be okay with that. <laughs> Well, when I went up there, um, I last last week I went from went to church every day last week um, because there was a little meeting up in up in uh, Carrollton that I went to. But there was something something's going on, you know, and I don't want to get into everything. But uh, the Lord seems to be, uh, you know, taking away uh, a dream of mine, and um, you know that's tough. But you hear so many times, I I think a lot about life. <clears throat> I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. I, and I, and I, mm, I think I think a lot about life and how the, it it goes it goes quick. And you know, you know I don't know when my last day is going to be here, but you know. So many times you just want to make a difference in life. Because we don't have that long. and We just want to make a difference. And we want to do something that's worth something. That, you know, you know, like when I look at my life and where I want to be when I'm 60 years old, I really don't care about money, but I want to have something that, something that nobody could give to you. Something that's worth something. Something that you've sacrificed for. But, um, you know, when you get thinking, you, and I never, I never want to get to feeling t sorry for myself because I'll tell you, he's right about anything he does. That's right, he's right about anything he does, and there's no reason to question him. But i tell you one thing, one thing, this song we're about to sing, it says I'm going to die on the battlefield, and it's talking about a Christian battlefield, and it's talking about dying in this fight that we're in. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll tell you one thing. No matter what happens, no matter where I where where my life takes me, I like to say, you know, I was talking to a person about what's going on, and he was helping me, and he tried to encourage me. He said, you know, God's sovereign in all His ways, and you know, one day you'll understand everything that's going on. I said, I said, I respect your opinion, and I I'm glad you're comforting me, but when I when it gets that time for me to understand, God don't owe me one thing. He don't owe me an explanation about anything because I tell you, he's right. He's right about whatever he says. And, uh, you know, that well, last week helped me because, you know, um, you know, uh, and I know I just preached this to the teenager. I just preached and I charged about this. But when John, when he was on the Isle of Patmos and all that was going on with his life, Brother Landers, he didn't tell, to give a long story about it. He said, I, John, was on the Isle of Patmos. That's all he said about Patmos. And that's, and he was on the spirit, in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. And I tell you, last week, no, I didn't. I enjoyed the preaching, don't get me wrong, but I tell you what I enjoyed. I enjoyed just being around his word, being around his word and, you know, being able to talk, talk to the pastor about the Bible on the way up there and, and on the way back, just talking about his word because... I'll tell you another thing I enjoy, and Pastor don't know anything about this, but these boys, these ninth grade, ninth grade and under, they love staying up all night when they go to these conferences and things. So. <laughs> and Ryan and Brother Devin back there, they didn't really, well, they wanted some sleep, so they sent them to my room, and they was playing Monopoly in there. And I said, y'all can play Monopoly, but well, I want to hear a testimony from all of you before you do it. And i tell you, you know, a lot of times... We don't think we're, our lives worth every, anything. But I tell you, when I heard them boys give testimonies, something happened, something changed in my heart. When I heard them boys give them testimonies, and I tell you, it's worth everything just to hear. And I'm not going to tell you which one it was, but they got to talking about, well, actually, J Brother Daryl. He got to talking about Jesus being his best friend. <laughs> when no one else is there, he said, Jesus is my best friend. And I said, <laughs> and I said, you're exactly right, Daryl. And don't you ever forget that. He's your best friend. And I tell you, he's worth every bit of it. And I tell you one thing, I want to die on this battlefield. <laughs> While we were up there, uh, Brother William Davis, he preached a message on uh, mercy. And 
how uh, we can never fully understand that mercy that God has given us and all that sacrifice that he gave for us. And uh, he, someone used the example there. Um, he, uh, they said uh, God didn't say it was uh, like, a vapor, vi- like a vapor. He said it was as a vapor. He didn't just use it as an example. He said it, it literally its almost as a vapor. It just disappears so quickly. It doesn't last very long. And I just realized how uh, much m- more uh, merciful and kind and how much I need to uh, work more for God and uh, follow his will and all that he tells me to do. Brother William Davis also uh, preached the message on how we could die any day. It could be, you know, a minute from now, an hour from now. We just never know. So we always, always have to make sure. That's why I always tell when I lead someone to Christ that I always make sure they're going to heaven before I leave their door, and I try my best to. So, because I don't want nobody, nobody in this room right now to go to hell, because I always want them to spend time in heaven. dreaming um what God's dreaming for our life and um I really got to thinking about that you know every little girl has a dream she wants to marry a guy and live in a really nice home and and just have everything that she's ever wanted but um I've been praying a lot and I feel so the Lord is dreaming for my life to be a missionary's wife or a pastor's wife or something like that (laughs) so yeah Um, one of the preachers um, preached a message. Like Marcy said, um, have you ever thought about what God's dream is for you? And I made a decision that day to stop trying to decide my future myself and to let God do it for me. Oh, wow. 
boys won that championship with that basketball game, and they had to play for, I don't know, six or seven games. And we work real hard on when they're done. You go over and shake everybody's hand. and You knock a boy down on the floor, which happens. You pick him up. Sportsmanship is what it's called. And so after they won that basketball game, a guy comes from comes up to me, a pastor from Ohio, and he says, that's your team? And I said, yeah, that's our team. And he said, I really enjoyed watching them pray. I didn't know they were in our hotel room. There was or a lot of hotel. Uh, there's a lot of churches that booked that hotel. And on the last day, we're loading up, and he comes over to me, same guy. He said, hey, I've been watching your group for the last couple of days. He said, how – how do you get them kids to do that? We've watched y'all. We've watched y'all. And I said, well, sir, it's the Lord. It's the Lord. And, of course, hey, you, you get in youth work. You, um, yeah, it's hard. It's difficult. It's, it's not the easiest thing to do. And he said, no, nah, tell me the nuts and bolts. I, I said, I'm, I'm telling you, it's the Lord. And uh, he said, but, you, but you've been involved with this a lot of years. I can see. I said, yes. And I said, if you're looking for nuts and bolts, I said, as long as you keep the majority loving the Lord, Amen. there is no one size fits all. He began to ask a couple of things about our young people. And uh, there's three or four young guys that's not here tonight and ride the buses and different things, but we brought them. They didn't all dress the same. They all don't look the same. He said, but I watched your older guys love the younger guys. I said, that's what I'm getting back. It's the Lord. And uh, I can tell you what you saw from these boys, especially Sam. He's the oldest. You're older than Ryan. You're, is he, he's older than you. He's the oldest. That was not fake tonight. And, uh, and what's going through his life, it wouldn't hurt one of you adults to ask permission to find out. God's doing something in his life that it ain't kid stuff no more. And here's a young man, he verbally told you tonight, whatever God sends his way, Hallelujah. he's trusting God. It's, it's that rich. It's that rich. I love them all. I love them all. Thank you all for going. And uh, give God your life. Adults, don't ever be ashamed of your child for stepping up for God. Don't ever be ashamed of him. That was good. Kelly had the best time out of everybody, though. I just tell you the truth, Kelly. Just... Kelly was a teenager again. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Get your Bible out. Get your Bible out tonight. And uh, I won't, we won't be long at all. I, I've, there's a series of messages that I'll fin ne finish next Sunday. But go to, go to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 12. We were dealing with discipleship last night. Brother and Mrs. Berry came and heard my spill for about 45 minutes. And uh, Brother and Mrs. Berry's praying about being a discipler, not a disciplee, they're going to take the horns and try to help somebody with the scriptures. I have two more nights with that. Next two Saturdays, five to six, uh, we would have left before six had there been no questions. It wasn't long. And uh, I want to challenge you again to this. And I want to make a statement tonight to help you with this. This is not a new fad that we're going to go through in church. This is not a new ministry um, in defense of COVID or in light of progression. No, this is where we're headed as a church. And I want you to understand we're not trying to divide the sheep from the goats with this. We're not trying to do that. What we are going to do with Journey, you saw the booklet in your bulletin this morning, uh, not everybody can do that. Not everybody has the talent. Not everybody has the gifts. Not everybody has the skill. Now, you probably can develop those things over the days. But it's a system that's administrated. It has a little bit of account. Well, it has a lot of accountability in it. It has a lot of commitment. I preached on that two Sunday nights ago. You have to have some type of sacrifice. This is not we'll do this two times. This is a 16-month journey that you're going to go on with somebody Something you're going to have to give a night a week out, or I say a night, an hour. You have to give an hour a week of your life. There may be a hiccup here or there, um, but you're really going to have to step up and have that commitment. Now, that's not available to you. Totally understandable. But it then is no excuse that you're not supposed to be a disciple of Christ. 
It's not an excuse that you're not, to, you're not supposed to invest in somebody's life. So I want to look at the Bible here just for a little bit. I've given those things to you. I'll be Jonathan Edwards tonight, not sinners in the hand of an angry God, but I am going to read. I'm going to read some things not as exciting as maybe it should be. Uh, but Romans chapter 12, let's go to verse number 9 tonight. Romans chapter number 12, and I want to look at verse number 9. And, and what we're dealing with is Christian love and fellowship. Now, I've put a title on this tonight that discipleship is hospitality. I will warn you, I'm going to step on a toe, a toe or two, not on purpose. But I want you to lay out, I want to lay out tonight how the Christian should be when it comes uh, with another Christian, especially when it comes with another sinner. Uh, there's a way that the, that, that the Lord has demanded I mean demanded, I should say commanded, but he's commanded us to live. So look at verse number 9, and I'm going to read down through verse number 13, and then I want you to follow me along in the notes. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love. In honor, preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints. And then read these three words with me. Ready? Given to hospitality. Lord, bless us here just for a few moments. Uh, that we can be a help to your people. Lord, your spirit has been demonstrated already in our service, and uh, the music was great, Lord. But there's just something special. I, I know it's probably my preference, but it sure is special when young people love God and nobody told them to. I thank you for that tonight. You've imparted uh, a great deal of encouragement to me tonight. And, Lord, I thank you for that. I thank you for it. But do, Lord, help us with the content here and where we're headed as a church, I thank you for allowing my church, the church that I pastor, to be ever so patient with their preacher. And so, Lord, I pray you'll help me to help them. And, Lord, I know from your word this is a direction that, Lord, it should have been taken um, the day I, I stepped out in ministry. It, it, it should have something. But I thank you for being patient with me and graceful with me and demonstrating mercy and allowing me to see things happen. Uh, in the ministry you've called me to. I pray again to bless us more and more as the days go go further. In Jesus' name, amen. A couple of things I want to bring out on purpose there, I don't want you to write this down, is the term distributing. The term distributing. Now, dissimulation there, of course, is hypocrisy. It's living one way and here and another way there. He tells us, let your love be without hypocrisy. Uh, if you're not careful, and it's happened in this church, I have been wrong in doing it time to You'll love people uh, for the wrong reasons. Uh, James says you can't love the rich man and hate the poor man in your church. Uh, but how many times have we gave preferential treatment to people? And it, it just happens. Not excusing it. I'm not excusing it. But if we're not careful, we'll have dissimulation. Uh, verse, verse number 10 talks about brotherly love. Brotherly love. Oh, listen to me. This is why we're called a family. Uh, the word brotherly, I'll comment one word on it. You need to be tender toward people. Tender, tender goes a long ways. Understanding. Patience there. Uh, not everybody's got to be right about a subject. How many times we come to a, a table and we just we don't allow ourselves to be wrong? Uh, there's something about being tender. There's something about demonstrating uh, brotherly love. Uh, I like verse number 11. won't preach on it tonight, but verse number 11 talking about slothful in business. Now, that's just flat-out laziness. Uh, we, often, we often will approach that to, to our work life, which is applied. Don't misunderstand me there. But here, we're not dealing here with the secular world. We're dealing with the physical or the spiritual world. Uh, Christians ain't supposed to be lazy toward one another. Uh, can I demonstrate in so simple a way? You get up off this pew and walk over and shake somebody's hand on this pew. It's just that simple. It's, 
It's just that simple. Uh, don't be slothful in business. Uh, then verse 13 comes down, and I've, I've, I've titled this Discipleship is Hospitality. So, so here's what I'm saying. I, we, we've already in the last couple of weeks, some of you, and we've talked already. I won't call your name here. But you've came and said, Preacher, I want to help disciple somebody. Well, after sitting at the table, uh, I have decided that this is not for you. Uh, this is big. You're, this is something that you're going to have to chunk off. I mean, it's a big chunk to take off here. Um, so, so don't get the wrong idea uh, that preacher don't want me doing this. Don't get the wrong idea that I got to stick with it. No, pl please understand what I'm saying here. I don't want you to think that discipleship's not for you because though you don't get wrapped up in a system, you've got to understand that your entire life is supposed to scream hospitality. It's supposed to scream tenderly love. It's supposed to scream brotherhood. It's supposed to scream uh, lack of laziness. And, and, and I bring those out because of that, because at some point, if you're going to be pleasing to the Lord, hospitality is something that you can't be uncomfortable with. Now, all of you demonstrate it, but probably not at the point that God wants you to demonstrate it. We all know kindness. We know affection. I believe tonight if somebody's house burnt down in the middle of the night and Blue, or what is it, Red Cross wouldn't put anybody up in a hotel, could you give them their basement? Now, uh, any of you here say, well, okay, maybe. <laughs> Thank you for going that far. But there ought to be some members, there ought to be a list say, well, let them come to my house and let them come to my house and let them, and then give them four options to choose. And da, 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 you know, uh, we, uh, Red Cross ought not be an option. Salvation Army ought not be a credit. Hey, we especially do good to those who are of the household of, you do, do catch what I'm saying. Now. But discipleship is lacking in our lives. It has happened in my life. Because we don't put, I ain't worried about our best foot forward, just put a foot forward is, is, is what needs to be taking place. So when we get down to verse number 13, let's dissect this a tad bit further here. And he says in the very first word there, distributing, distributing to the saints. It's a distribution center. It's a warehouse, if you will. Now, what does this mean? And you go study it now. Get your Strong's Concordance and, and go through that thing and study it. But in a nutshell, it's talking about the ability to share. Uh, God has imparted things to you to share. So, so listen very carefully here. The poorest person in our church has something to share. You have something to give. So it's this sharing mentality in parentheses, if you'll write this down, it'll make a lot of sense here, but it mainly comes down to the part of communication. Now you study that out when you get a chance. I won't go through all the, uh, the objects there and the subjective mentality or the subjective uh, definitions that maybe a Strong's will give you, but this distributing is, is having the ability to share things, but mo main, mo mainly in the area of a communication. Now, I won't get into it fully here just with this one word, but the Christian ought to be able to readily and quickly. It even said in the days of tribulation, don't worry about what you'll say because there's something called the Holy Ghost will tell you what to say. Now what I mean by that, when there's things that come place in your life, now you'll be ready to defend with the Spirit, of course, though he's not so defensive as much as he is offensive and he has the sword of the Spirit and you understand that I believe tonight. But you'll be able to say to somebody, house burns down. Somebody loses everything they got. You understand, uh, it's really not what you have necessarily, uh, but it's that pat on the back that a man again, everything's going to be okay. Can we pray together? But listen to me, the Christian that doesn't learn hospitality, the Christian who gets in the rut of their life, the Christian who takes care of theirs and nobody else. Hey, listen to me. The Great Commission's not a suggestion. It's not an ideal. It was God's way, wait now, not to build the church. It was his way to get the gospel to a lost and dying world. All a Christian's got to be ready to do is distribute. 
That, that's all you got to do. It, it's amazing there. Uh, circle the word necessity, if you would, please. The word necessity here. I just give you quick words. Again, study these things. But necessity here is the idea of employment. There's an employment here. He goes on to say about you then make it, you're an affair. You're an affair. It's your job. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's almost, if you will, demanding. Uh, we look back at the church in Acts. I don't look at a church of 60 years ago and make the example for the 21st century. It may give us encouraging ideas, but the example goes back to Acts. How did they go from 3,120 uh, where they multiplied and multiplied and multiplied? There was folks who got saved. They got born again. They got liberated from Judaism and the law and no longer circumcision is what bound the soul to the flesh as their thinking was. Man, they were ready. It was a necessity. I can't but speak the things which I've seen. <laughs> Boom, my goodness. But we live in a day when a neighbor moves right next door. We look at the blinds for him for six weeks. At least and leave it to beaver days. They took him a pie. <laughs> That's funny, what Miss Karen? <laughs> You, you follow what I'm saying? Uh, so he then says here, distributing to the necessity. And of course, he lays in saints here. I'll show you uh, sinners here in just a moment here. Uh, but we're ready to distribute. We're, we're ready to share. I, if you've ever taken somebody for a meal uh, after church or invited them to your home, which many of you have, and I'm thankful for it. I'm at the point now with y'all's ministration together. I can give you a call up. Y'all like a couple of weeks, I understand that. But can you take him out to eat and take him out? And I'm thankful for you church members who do that thing. And y'all work it up. And you dear ladies got to have the house clean and all that. And I understand y'all, but you understand bologna sandwich would be sufficient. You understand a crock pot full of spaghetti noodles would be sufficient. It's not what you're ready to eat. It's the fact that you're ready to communicate. Yeah. You're ready to distribute something to them. Oh, necessity is a wonderful thing. Look after that semicolon there and how it goes down. Ready? Given to. No, wait now. Given to hospitality. The term given to, and I'll give you just the, the surface of it again. Get your strongest concordance and look at it. But it means to literally pursue. Literally pursue. Now, now don't misunderstand me tonight, but I'm going to use a physical illustration to help you with this. And here's what happens. Somebody comes into the church. Brother Calvin, oh, you, 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 when, when a visitor comes into church, you ever catch yourself pursuing them? Now, now I've, I, I've been taught in this. I, I'd like to think the Spirit of God does more than my education. But, but I'm like a bloodhound when a visitor comes to church, and, and, and it's to the point now I'm generally not the first person to them. The ushers get them. But this is why I want somebody in the parking lot. This is why I want somebody getting a bulletin when they get out of the car. Now, maybe some southern folks like, man, right up on them. Get right up on them. There's people who want that more than those who don't want that. I'm trying to dip, distribute hospitality. But, but listen to what I'm saying. Then someone comes there. I, that's why I'm going to get you teenagers. When a teenager walks in the door, y'all go crowd them. Amen. You say, I'm Sam, and I'm Bill, and I'm Sue, and this is my brother Larry, and this is my other brother Larry, and you just... <laughs> i got to keep you awake somehow. But you got to understand, when you leave the presence of those people, they're not going to fault you for being... Friendly. They're not going to fault you for not being kind. They're not going to fault you for being loving. Now, wait now. There comes a point here where it tells us that we've got to demonstrate all these things. We've got to be demonstrate. But here's one thing that we've got to be given to is hospitality. It's, it's got to be the way of our life. So hospitality is mentioned three times in the Bible. We'll cover all three of them tonight. But the first one here, jot these things down in your notes. 1 Peter 4, 9, I'll read it to you. Use hospitality one to another, and look how it puts it, without grudging. Now, I, I, I won't go into the, into the persuasion through definitions and so forth, you're going to have to trust me with my 14 years of experience here. 
There are people who have a hard time with it. And I'd like to think I understand, and, and, and listen how I put it. Here's where I start stepping on some toes kindly. I don't care how you cut it, it's a wrong excuse. There is no room for a Bible-believing Christian to get upset about loving another person. Now, specifically here, the saints. There's a, there's a mold that I think that has been cut out of our church, and again... The church was doing great before I ever got here. I've read every bit of history that I can. I know the plethora, that's multitude of pastors who've came and gone and came and gone. But that goes back to 19, 1860 plus. I get that. But it's synoptic with the attitude, not of churches from the south, but from churches all across the world. When hope dies, we kind of just go ahead and put Ichabod on the church. But when there's a resurrection of Jesus Christ, not physically now, but when hope is made alive again about Christ, when that which is inside is exposed, when that which is inside is expected, when that inside which is motivated, listen to me, you can be a hospital person for Christ. All you have to do is, hi, how you doing? You want a bologna sandwich? Come to my house. And then they find out there are people who still care about Jesus Christ. Now, wait now. You don't have to chart it off for us living in the days of Laodicea where nothing can be done for God. We don't believe in a dispensation of that age. We believe he's always will be, and he always is, my friend. The hope of glory is not my niceness. The hope of glory inside of me is Jesus. But there are those who would say, and if you, you, you folks who know, I ask you sometimes, but you know it wasn't always easy to ask you? Yeah, the missions conference have been difficult lately. COVID, of course, made everything difficult. But my great desire one day is to bring five to six missionary couples in here. But rather than put them up four nights in a hotel, which is going to call X amount of thousand dollars, I'd like to use one of your rooms in your house. But do you know why we don't generally do that? Because as soon as I ask, you're like, oh, you think you can find somebody else? Because we live in days of weirdness. You understand that, right? You don't know them and they don't know you. And <laughs> Preacher, can't we be like a little house on a prayer and give them the, the barn? <laughs> Which would be better than nothing. Jesus born in the end. You, hint, 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 you get what I'm saying. The mentality gets down to being grudging about it. Often makes us wonder, do you have what I have? It's an amazing thing there. So our Christian love should not only be fervent and forgiving, and that's who the Christian is, but it should be also practical. There's a couple things I want to give you tonight, and I'll go fairly quickly here. We will turn so you can see some scriptures. But number one, we should share our homes with others in generous uh, hospitality, uncomplaining, by the way, and we should use our spiritual gifts in ministry one to another. You know, I, I, of course, I hate being cheesy and motivating and different things like that. I preached a lot on that this morning. I'm not Joel Osteen, as you can tell in the hair. Amen. Amen. But can I wax you wonderful here just for a second? You folks are not as bad as you think you are. You are not as boring as you think you are. Your life is not nonchalant as you think it is. I'm a nobody preacher. Quit talking like that. You are a somebody, and yes, because of Christ. But I pastor a great group of people who are not perfect. I understand this. But you are a great group of people because the potential is there inside of you. Again, not because of us, but because of Christ. A night in your home 
from a family that's gone through a tragedy. Yeah. It ain't going to kill you, but it sure will help them. There was a family here recently that I had to my home, and we said to the children of the home, and they've been coming just a little bit, said to the children, I said, hey, what's your favorite meal? And the child, the smallest child in the family automatically spoke up and said, I love macaroni and cheese. And so the mom and dad said, don't. I said, no, do they like macaroni and cheese? And I got what the kids like. We had a main meal and so forth. When that kid come to our house, she went and got one of those metal pans, you know, those big metal uh, disposable pans. And Shauna made, she looked up a recipe to get the creamiest. And I'm telling you, we take that uh, macaroni and cheese, and, we, and it's just dripping, you know, with cheese and so forth. Man, he just didn't eat it. The whole family ate it. Man, they stayed at our house for maybe an hour and a half. This was during the week. Uh, Sundays wouldn't work for them. And they come to our house. No, wait now. They took the whole pan home when they're done. The little that was left. He goes to the back. Ben's getting out of the toy stage. Our rule has always been one of our toys always leaves our house when a family that has kids comes. So Ben goes back. and I, You gave him Spider-Man, didn't you? Wasn't it Spider-Man or... Batman, one of them, and, and so the kid comes out, and the mom's like, no, go put that back. I said, no, ma'am, it's our rule. It's your rule. What do you mean it's your rule? When they leave, that's how I get rid of all the toys. That's how we get rid of all the toys. And, uh, and here, Ben's, that boy's got that little old Batman, and, and I don't, we probably didn't even buy it. My mom or dad probably bought it, and man, he walks down the stairs, and he's got his macaroni cheese, and he's got his Batman in his arm, and he comes back to church the next service. He comes up to me and said, hey, when we come into your house again? <laughs> and mom and dad quit doing that and quit doing that, and then here's what dad says, but now if you invite us, we'll come. Now, for the most part, most all you've been to my house, and if you've not, let us know. We'll get you on a list. But you can't have Ben's toys. Ben's getting ticked with his hospitality. <laughs> the spread was given. One of my boys stands and prays. We eat the meal. It's wonderful. We pray twice in our family. That's just our tradition. Don't, don't do it. But after we consume it, we then thank God again for it. Another boy stands and prays. And while the small talk is going on, while the kids are playing, Dad is so interested. I said, you, got, you look like you have a question. Here's what he says. How do you get this much peace around your table? Amen. And I said, we start with prayer and we end with prayer. My home was open to them. They didn't go to revival. It wasn't Sunday night church. It was a home. Good Christian music was playing when they came in. It was playing when the meal was being. Most of you been, we don't have a big kitchen. We don't even serve from the table no more. It's all buffet at my house. My boys are so big. They bring their table right there. Come to my table. And they ate our food. It was an hour and 45 minute time. Question after question after question. What did they see? Oh, they didn't see the glory of Bubba. They saw the glory of God. No way now. Preacher, where'd you learn that? It came from the Bible. It didn't matter if it was macaroni and cheese or I think we had roast or something. that I can't remember what the meat was or the main dish. And we had brownies and... And ice cream from Dollar General. It don't take a much. I could have had bologna sandwiches and it would have been just as good. Number two, write this down. In the New Testament, in New Testament times, hospitality was important because there was few inns and poor Christians could not afford to stay at them anyway. Persecuted saints, especially in particular, would need places to stay where they could be assisted and be encouraged. Now why? Because they're being arrested. It's interesting. Number three, write this down. Oh, I've got to go. Hospitality then is a virtue. Please write it down. That is commanded and commended throughout the scriptures. Moses even included in the law. Now, I won't go through it, but it's Exodus 22 and Deuteronomy chapter 14. Boy, you could not turn away the stranger. 
You could not turn away the stranger. Number four, write this down. Jesus then enjoyed hospitality. I won't go through all the verses with him. But he, but so did his disciples or apostles, if you want to write that down, in their ministry. And the apostles there made it very clear that they took care of each other. Philemon 22 goes as far as to say this, but with all prepare me. This is the writer writing a letter to Philemon. Paul, he says, with all prepare me also a lodging. For I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. Sounds a little forward, doesn't it? Paul writes a letter, says, I'm coming, get me a house ready. I'm coming. One of our favorite evangelists here, I won't say your name, his name without his permission. But I, I love him. I love him to death. I asked him if he'd come. He said, I'd love to come. I get a, I'll get a letter a week later. He said, if you'll send me $500 and confirm my hotel reservation. I thought, what, you, you jerk? Teresa got the check ready because I wanted to have him so bad. I knew he'd help us. I send the check and it come out. He said, why did you send it so early? I said, because you asked for it. And I didn't say it with that sarcasm, but I said, you asked for it. He said, Brother Landers, do you understand why I did that? And I did. I said, I have no idea. I said, can I ask you a question? I said, did you not think that we would be a blessing to you before you came? He apologized to me. He said, Brother Landers, I'm sorry for that spirit. He said, but I took for granted that you would take care of me. Listen to me. He's been the biggest help to our church that any evangelist has had, had in my life in 14 years. He assumed we would take care of him. I'm so glad our church took that assumption and said, yes, we take care of our speakers. We are a hot. Wait now. Wait now. If you tonight, I'm talking about you. How many of you dear men would come to me and say, preacher, I can't pay my light bill this week. And there's a lot of good men in here, so I ain't asking the church. I probably wouldn't ask either. I'd go find a part-time job somewhere, shovel something, do something. But, 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 but listen to me. Listen to me. We want to help. Anybody want to see your brother struggle? One of us has a house fire tonight, you're going to... Let somebody come over. If the landers have it, y'all at least two, 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 two there. Eh? We won't hurt your hot water heater that bad. Do, do, but do you catch what we're saying tonight? There's an issue of hospitality. There's an issue of getting deep inside of it. Number five, write this down. Human hospitality is a reflection then of God's hospitality to us. Luke 14, 16 says this. Then said he unto them, a certain man made a great supper and bade many. How many of you know how many of them come? None of them. None of them come. This is the great wedding feast, and oh, he bade many. And then he told his disciples, y'all hurry and go into the highways and the hedges. And how many things will he invited the Gentiles, amen? amen. Hallelujah. I'll, I'll take a seat at that table, amen. <laughs> oh, hospitality, number six, write this down, and here's where we'll draw to a conclusion. Christian leaders then in particular should be given to hospitality. Right, now look, I've given it to you. I believe it's written there in the text. I have a word for you. But here's the two other mentions of the term hospitality. And Brother Coward, I'll finish it here tonight. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2 then, and then fill the blanks in if I, I think I have them there for you. A bishop, now that's pastor, that's a, that's a pastor. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. Here's the requirements, vigilant, sober, and all those are true. I'm not emphasizing those tonight. Good behavior. But here's what a preacher is supposed to be, given to hospitality. Do you understand that? Given. Now, the word givenness here is the term fond of guest. It's uh, the hospitality issue, excuse me. It's mean fond of guest. Oh, I, I said uh, to a couple men Sunday nights, last Sunday night was a long day. I got up here at 7 and... Uh, Brother Rhymes did a great job. It was a joy to hear him preach. And 
uh, kind of have a day off. And I, I took uh, uh, mom and dad, uh, opened their home up, and we had a meal there with the rhymes. And so we were there. Sean and I came down here. She's working on some music. Choir practice starts, and and it all goes over again. And and then there was the fellowship there uh, with the birthdays, and Miss Phil did a great job, and, and that was all good. And then we had the rhymes over our house again last night, or that Sunday night. And uh, at 9:30, I was like, "Well, I hope they can leave quick." Whoa. I was telling some, some of you men that was here Sunday night, and one man asked, said, Preacher, you look tired. I said, I'm dead tired. I said, man, why do these people want to sit here and talk? Let's go home. <laughs> now, I don't talk like that out loud. I'm being a little facetious. And I'm not great at it. But you got to be a lover of it. I tell these boys who pray about preaching, I'm, hey, Preach. You ever heard a preacher say, you ever a preacher say this, man, you build your church on preaching. Now, I know what they mean by that. Don't misunderstand what I'm about to say, and don't go creating heresy out of me. But I've been doing this thing almost 20 years. You don't build a church on preaching. You build it on loving people. Do you know how you love people? Macaroni and cheese. I, I, I mean it. I mean it. Crock pot on Sunday. Hey, what are y'all doing Monday night? Y'all want to come over? Hey, Sean, are we doing anything? Somebody wants to invite us over Monday, and it's happening this Monday. I'm telling you, she's like, let me. I don't have to cook. Let's go. <laughs> but where I'm going tomorrow night to eat a meal, there's no impression going on. It's somebody who loves us. And somebody says, hey, I, I want to have the preacher over. If you invite me, I'll come over. Uh, Mark and Don, I broke their chair one night. You remember that, Mark? You remember that, brother? Yeah, I still owe him a chair. <laughs> you, uh, wh wh why are you doing stuff like that? Man, you got to be given to it. Listen to me. I, 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 I forgot to bring the book over. You ain't got to go through journey discipleship to be a disciple, a discipler. Won't you start off by looking at somebody tonight, say, brother, I love you. You've encouraged me in the Christian life. Why don't you say to somebody, Sunday, next Sunday. Y'all y'all doing it? Uh, Leah, do y'all love Jamera? <laughs> I, I, oh, I should have asked you this. I don't mean to call you out. I sat and watched her on the porch today walk up to Jamera and say, Jamera, you want to go eat some Mexican? And Jamera, I don't know if you heard her, but she said, I'm all about Mexican. Is Jamera in the back? Is she in the back there? And uh, I said, okay, I watched Jamera. She left my conversation. She's going to Mexican Sea Preacher. <laughs> I, I don't I don't know I mean but chips and salsa and the number two on the lunch special can't be over eight bucks what what was that it was Leah Butler loving a 21 year old girl Amen. they're sisters did you Ben did y'all go to eat today Ben comes up to us and Ben's got this bad habit or he did he go ask people to, to go over their house we stopped that a couple months ago. I mean, we stopped it. Ben, you don't ask nobody to go over to their house. They got to invite you. Ben comes up and says, Daddy, we didn't ask nobody. Nobody, I didn't ask nobody. But JB asked me to go eat with him. Can I, can I, can I, can I, can I? <laughs> you better be telling the truth, boy. Was Jesus not always breaking bread? Now, I'm not saying that's how you do it. There's different ways to love people. But here's what I'm saying, church. And those who are going to help me with discipleship, thank you. I mean, you have the time. Some of you, we hadn't vetted you yet. And, and we'll get through it. But here's what I'm telling you. You can help disciple people by taking them to Mexican. 
I hope you made her pray for that food. I hope. <laughs> but it's like I sat down the other night with a family. And that the little boy, just to be honest with you, who's loving that macaroni and cheese, he gets his plate, been in my little house, goes around the corner there, he gets the plate, he sits down. I don't think they have prayer in their house because he ain't waiting. So I wait till everybody gets there, and I said, now, hey, we're going to have prayer before this is over. And his big brother said, you better quit. And in our home, we hold hands around the table. That's just how we do it. And they joined in with us, put their head down, took his hat off. I didn't look at him and say, hey, brother, take that house, my hat off of my house. Prayer took care of it. And then when we're done, we told them, before, start and finish, hey, we'll come, we'll school be out. They stayed an extra 45 minutes. That was okay with us. Because she's talking to my wife and I'm talking to him. And the kids go back and find out that our bedrooms are dirty too. Come on, say amen, Landers boy. <laughs> they walk out. I get a text on the way home. That was an awesome night. The macaroni and cheese? If I'd done it right, I'd fed them chipino. Lobster tails. Are y'all uh, escargot? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Too far right, right there. Should have gave them spams what I should have done. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but macaroni and cheese, a vegetable, pot roast, something like that. And they had a good night. And they had a good night. Well, praise the Lord. You know what I'm talking about tonight. Get busy loving on folks. Get busy treating people the way Americans used to treat people. That's how it works. Father, you've been good to us tonight. Thank you, Lord, for your people. Thank you for your word. Help us leave this place tonight with a freshness of our spirit, our Christian attitude, our Christian example. Lord, help us not only look for church members. Help us to go invite a neighbor down the road to come eat with us. Take somebody fishing with us. Go share a Coke with somebody. I don't know. I don't know what people's ideas are. But just sit down with somebody and love them. Ask them about their soul. Tell them about Jesus. Tell them the chief of sinner that I used to be, and because of the blood of Christ, I'm a saved sinner now. Lord, I don't know. Please, please. Lord, tonight, Allow something to be born in the heart of somebody tonight. Let us not be grudging. Let us not be critical. Let us who are Christian leaders in Christ and deacons and pastors and, and all those things and Sunday school teachers, let us understand this is, this is what we are. This is who we are. Oh, dear Lord, help us tonight. We love you. We love you. With head bowed and eyes closed, I invite you to stand with me, would you please? I'm going to have the instruments play. Brother Goucher is going to sing a song. Christians, would you come be that way? Teenagers, would you come? Would you get out of your shell just a little bit and love on somebody else? Some of these young kids that ride the bus, they just need somebody to love them. Some girl to put your arm around them. And these little old girls sitting on the pew this morning, all they just need is somebody to love them. That's it. Come on, Christian, if you need help in that, won't you come? Come ask God to give you wisdom. You say, preacher, I don't have a clue how to do some of those things. And that's fine. We do live in culture today that doesn't, that doesn't put forth their foot that way any longer. Just come ask God to help you. You're not going to correct nobody. You're, you're, you're not going to discipline somebody. You're just going to love them. That's all you're going to do. Oh, that's good. That's good. So many of us have done it before. So by, so many of us have done it before. I, 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 I was joking with Brother Matt. He's, his wife's down here in the altar. He calls me up one day and said, Preacher, you like catfish? And I said, I like catfish. And he takes me up close to where his pallet shop is, and there's this little old place on the corner. I want to say it's called Fred's or something. Temple, I think it's Temple, somewhere up there. 
He said, he says, my treat. I said, okay, I'll come. I'm, uh, I'm in a polo or something. Matt's fixing to go drive a big rig. He sits down with his pastor, and we share a bowl of Brunswick stew, some catfish. And uh, I've enjoyed Brother Matt for years. But we sat there and enjoyed each other's fellowship. It was one of the best we ever had. And, uh, you, you know, it doesn't take much to enjoy Christian fellowship. It does. Miss Susan was here this morning. Do you know what she loves about us? She said, we got here early and you took time with us. Now, I've never had her out for a meal or over to the house. But she thought, taking time with She said, you knelt down on that pew and put your arm around my neck. And that's how I led her to Christ. And she, Miss Susan, if you don't know her, she's, she's probably 60 plus, isn't she? She's, yeah, she's an elderly lady. But I, she just needs somebody to love her. Her life's depleting. Her health's depleting. And I just put my arm around a lady that's like my mama. And she, th she tells me, you're the best preacher I've ever had. And, you know, I want to just say to her, well, you ain't heard much. All it took was a little bit of love. That's all it takes, a little bit of love. See, we, we worry about being right on everything. You're going to find out the thirst to being right ain't going to get you as far as the thirst for being loving. People stick around our church, and I know it. I know it. I know it. I am not a great preacher. I don't want to hear anybody on the porch say, all preacher, you really are. You, I don't want to hear it. I know I'm not a great preacher, but I want to be a great lover of people. These, these kids here, the joy of being here so long is, boy, I've seen you in diapers. His little sisters are coming to school, and I keep, I keep, a, I keep a, a jug full of uh, those little Smarties, you know, those little Smarty candies. And that, sometimes I'm there studying that, that little Alyssa. She'll come, she'll scare the fire. I didn't hear her walk in. And she'll, she'll poke me right on the shoulder. But what are you doing? She'll say, preacher, I got my homework done. I said, you want a piece of candy, don't you? She said, yep. So she'll get over there, and I'll, here's what I'll do. I'll go, get you two of them, but don't tell Lola. But Lola always finds out. That's why I call her lips. She's got a big mouth. And then here comes Lola, and here comes. Man, I've, I've been their pastor for so long. What am I doing with them? I'm learning to be hospitable to them. Because there comes a day. Sam calls me and says, Preacher, you got to pray for me. Yeah, I got to be hospital then too. I got to be hospital to you. Don't hurt my feelings if you stick around here because I love you more than I preach at you. I love you. And I watch these young people serve God. God. Devin coming back home has been a I wish I could bronze him and make him a trophy and put in my office. Bobby's fixing to hold a little baby. I yelled at, You still remember me yelling at you that day? Oh, he made me mad. Him and Jamal made me junkyard dog, man. It came out way. It just came out. It was so mad I called their parents, told them I apologize. I apologize. Oh, don't worry about it. He needs it. And they come back to my office and said, boy, I'm sorry. I told them I am sorry. But now I'm gonna hold I'm gonna hold his baby here in a couple months. I'm glad I apologized to you, sir. I love you more than I want to be right with you. Now let's let's demonstrate that at work tomorrow. <laughs> Somebody comes to work, love them. Preacher, they're heathen. Find out what their favorite candy bar is. It still works. Bomb of their favorite cup of coffee. You get that tonight? Most churches don't get that. 
It works with your spouse too. Works with your kids. Lead them kids a note every so often. Put it, put it in between the jelly and the peanut butter and let them bite into it. I'm serious. You got to get it. It can't be. It's got to be not standard paper though. God bless you. You get it tonight. Father, please help us. Lord, thank you for your folks. They've given me a little time tonight. Very serious subject. Very serious. Very serious. Lord, tonight I pray we've not been entertained. I pray we've tonight have been challenged. And God, I would say tonight if one person could be changed, and I will take it. But Lord, when we meet back here Wednesday night, may the Spirit so worked on the spirit of people that we'll see a fresh handshake and we'll see a smile. We'll see love between brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, help us bring somebody to church Sunday that's not been begged to come or highwayed to come, but someone who has been loved this week and they need to get here. Oh, I pray that would be the case tonight. We love you. We thank you. In Christ's name. Amen. Leaders, am I missing any announcement? I, I've been quick through all that tonight. Any announcements I'm missing? All righty. God bless you. You are dismissed.